We're good to go. Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I see some familiar faces and uh, lots of good people we want to help uh, understand some things we're doing and invite some collaboration. So I'm really excited that you're all here. So uh, my name is Craig Peters. I'm a product manager at Mirantis. And I'm Alexander Tevelkov. I'm principal software engineer in Mirantis working for upstream Morana team. So we're going to talk today about how you do applications across multiple infrastructures. So what, the, what is hybrid cloud? And so I, I want to address sort of why. Why do we care at all? What is it all about? And you know, if we're doing things across multiple infrastructures, uh, you know, what choices do we face? There's some really hard choices that we have to um, make as we figure out the architecture and we figure out the implementation for this. We're going to walk through a specific use case to kind of highlight some, uh, some of those choices and the options that we have. Uh, and, and in that use case, we've actually gone through some experimentation, and we want to talk about that experiment and, uh, and then invite you guys to collaborate in that experiment. So we have some pictures here that are kind of fun. So um, this, the one on the lower left is us about 25 minutes ago doing the slides. And uh, <laughs> the one on the upper right is uh, an illustration of how easy it is to collaborate because, uh, you know, even though it's the Russian bear, we're, we're friendly. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's really the message there. So let's talk a little bit about why you want to do hybrid cloud. So, you know, it's getting a lot of press and a lot of noise. And, you know, everybody's been talking about this for a very long time. And we don't see, in reality, a lot of applications running in multiple infrastructures today. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and we'll dig into that today. Um, but the reason that it's important and why people keep investing in it is that there are a lot of attributes of applications and applications running inside real enterprises that um, will benefit greatly if we can do hybrid cloud correctly. So uh, one of those is really about availability. So we all know, you know that pets versus cattle metaphor, right? And so the, the, the idea is that that's great in the cloud, but the application itself can't have those attributes, right? The cloud native application needs to be highly available. Well, how do you do that if the underlying infrastructure doesn't have five nines, right? It's got some number less than that. So the way you do that is you spread your risk. You move your application across multiple infrastructures. Another is about flexibility, right? You want to have applications that can take advantage of things that are specific to different kinds of infrastructures. And uh, so some infrastructures have, you know, super fast east-west networks, and other infrastructures have very specialized load balancers, and others have high-speed storage. And so you need to be able to take advantage of that infrastructure while also getting this availability. And at the same time, you want to uh, comply with regulatory issues, right? So people want hybrid because they need to have their application that deals with personal human data in the region where that person lives, right? Because the law may say data for a German resident can't live outside of Germany, for example, right? And so th these, these kinds of uh, regulatory compliance have to be uh, accounted for in your, in your hybrid infrastructure. And, and a lot of people are doing this because they want to um, essentially outsource uh, the management of their infrastructure. And part of that's about driving down cost, right? So this is one of the reasons for public clouds. But all of these reasons are valid. But for me, the, the thing that I like to focus on uh, when, when thinking about this is that the, the end goal for all of this kind of application development is about actually accelerating the rate, you know, the velocity here, of delivery of capability to the end user. Right? And, and so as we get into the next slide, that'll become, become apparent why, why I put it that way. But it's really, you know, the, the thing I want to emphasize for people is that we, we need to focus on how fast applications get to users, because that's where the value gets created. Right? So what do we mean? by hybrid. What is a hybrid? Right? So, you know, an applications, all applications have had to have the ability to move from one infrastructure instance to another, basically for disaster recovery, you know, forever, right? So that's kind of the upper left corner of this 
quadrant here. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm saying there's a spectrum of different kinds of things that hybrid means. So if you go down from there, you know, one kind of hybrid is, well, I need to have the ability to move an application from one type of infrastructure to another type of infrastructure. So that's kind of the first stage of hybrid. And on the other end of the spectrum is applications that are running in real time with session management across multiple of the same infrastructure or on multiple of different infrastructures with different underlying assumptions and capabilities. And it, when you do that, you have all kinds of additional challenges around data replication and data proximity that you have to deal with. But this, this is such a simplified view. In fact, what, what I was tempted to do is make an animation where it was those four and then I plop the, the big arrows in the middle. Because what happens is that every application has a different style. So a, a great example uh, is Internet of Things, right? So Internet of Things is really hybrid application, but in a different way. You may have parts of these patterns, but then you also have edge applications. You have services that are a part of your application that have to be deployed closer to the end user, right? And those have to have certain attributes and characteristics that they can conform to. You also have, uh, well, I don't want to go into too many examples. I can spend too, too much time here. But the idea is that every application architecture is possible. And when you make your choices about how you implement hybrid application management, you constrain which of those architectures that you can effectively manage. Right. So now that we kind of have laid the groundwork for what do we mean by hybrid, we actually mean a whole spectrum of things, you know, we have to ask the question, well, how are we going to manage that? Right. So if you think about the full application stack all the way from bare metal up to the bits and bytes that the user consumes or inputs or another system inputs or consumes, you know, we, we've, we've created these abstraction layers which give us different capabilities at each of those layers. And so the logical thing that we all tend to do, and if, I, if you look at all the hybrid solutions out in the marketplace, what they do is they take advantage of capabilities in one of those layers in order to provide the ability to manage applications across multiple infrastructures. And what happens is that each of the, at each of those layers, you know different things about what infrastructure is beneath it, uh, what is the state of the application at that layer, and what monitoring data is available uh, in order to take corrective action, right? Because if we think about hybrid applications, you know, it's critically important not only that we have flexibility, but that it have the, the ability to understand the state of what should be and be able to take, have an understanding of what infrastructure it's depending on so it can fix what's wrong. Right. And so we have to, you know, there's, there's a lot of analysis, there's tons of research papers around this specific area, but I, I wanted to raise this because it highlights uh, the need for a certain kind of specificity in, in what you do when you, when you design the system that's going to manage hybrid applications. So now what I want to do is I, I want to walk through a very simple, this is, you know, a very simple kind of use case. Uh, to, to, sh to help you understand the experiment we've done and why we've done this experiment in this way. Right? So in this case, uh, what we're doing is we're saying, well, we want to have an application that we deploy to one of two infrastructures. In this case, I mean, it could, it's easy to add additional ones to this, but, but for simplicity, we said, I want to be able to deploy this application to either OpenStack or AWS. Right? I want that to be a drop-down box, and I want to be able to choose either one. Of course, this is needs to be a system that has an API and a CLI so it can be completely automated, but we have a UI here to help it be clear what it is we're trying to do. So I, I've chosen AWS, and then based on that, my next step is to choose what load balancers are available in that. Right? And obviously the application has to be able to know well, what capabilities, well, it has to be able to express what capabilities it requires of a load balancer for it to be a valid selection in this context, and it has to understand what infrastructure, the infrastructure that is the target, can possibly provide. Right. So, we'll, you know, what what is deployable and manageable in that infrastructure? And so, if, if if you think about this use case, it means that you have to have 
um, not only understanding of that underlying infrastructure, but the ability to deal with different layers of abstraction in the system. So we did this experiment in Murano. So Murano is an OpenStack project. You know, it's actually, a, it's a, been a, a part of the OpenStack namespace for quite some time. And we wanted to take a minute to explain what it is so you can get, as Alex is going to explain more details of this experiment and the work we're doing, um, it, it makes sense. So Murano fundamentally is an integration framework. So it, it is also a catalog. The OpenStack catalog is an important attribute of it. It's a way to publish things. But, but at its core is the ability to flexibly describe relationships and dependencies between application components. Right? So it provides a class hierarchy where you can describe sort of abstract classes or very specific concrete classes that uh, represent what capabilities you want to take advantage of in your application management. It also provides a very powerful framework for being extremely explicit about the inputs and outputs on those, those uh, classes. And it's extremely powerful because it matches both you know, the power of declarative infrastructure programming, where you say, this is the state I want to be, but also it's imperative. It can take inputs uh, from other systems or users and then do if then else kind of logic or looping logic, right? And, and doing those things to, uh, in, in other frameworks is often very complex, and Morano does this in a very nice way. It's very important to state that it, it essentially has an API, so the whole idea of all of this is that we are automating this from some higher level system, like a business process system or an OSS. It has CLI, so the developer can interact with it, or, uh, or it could be automated in your, in your continuous deployment framework. And um, it has a catalog, and the catalog, you know, the reason we chose the Lego motif for the slide is the catalog allows you to publish building blocks and then higher level building blocks. So it's a, it's a mechanism for enabling your developers to collaborate across very disparate domains. So you can have developers who are focusing on database capabilities and developers who are focusing on what does it mean to add or remove a customer from your customer system. And they don't have to, uh, you know, this is a place for them to publish the interfaces for how they work and create dependencies between these things. So I can compose an application that depends on a bunch of bu other building blocks. So I think that's the, at a high level. This is the way I like to think about Murano. From here, Alex will take it. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so let's dive into details a little bit. I'm not going to frighten you with the technical implementation details, but let's speak about what is Murano under the hood? What is under those flexibility, specificity, and power? And how it empowers you, the application developers, to target your applications to multiple clouds? So let's start with the flexibility part, with the class hierarchy. As an application developer, as any application developer probably knows, one of the most powerful things in the software development world is the object-oriented paradigm because it provides a very clear and very, uh, very simple idea of going from abstract to the concrete. And that's what we have put into core of Murano, the very core of Murano, uh, because Murano is actually under the hood, uh, below all those cloud-specific and OpenStack-specific layers, is a fully powerful object-oriented language, which operates on regular good old classes with properties, attributes, and methods, and almost a regular, slightly different, but you may think it's a regular object-oriented hierarchy of inheritance chains. It's, it supports multiple inheritance with, a very, with some special, special magic, but from the user's point of view, it provides you a hierarchy of classes where on the top there are abstract entities, and on the bottom there are concrete implementations of the specific things. So when you speak about the orchestration of resources and clouds, when you, speak, uh, when you think of it on a high level, you just need to orchestrate resources. For example, the compute resources, like nodes. And from the application point of view, it often doesn't matter what kind of node that is. It may be a virtual machine running on some cloud. That may be a bare metal node, which just which was pre-deployed by some admins and have the SSH connection on it, 
or that may be container. Everybody speak about container right now. So for the application developer, I often don't care as an application developer. I just need my software to be installable on whatever node it is and make use of the generic capabilities of it. However, if I want to target my node for a specific cloud, I may say that, okay, I want my application to run on Amazon node or OpenStack node or Windows Azure node. You know, Murano once started as a Windows data center deployment application, and so we still have passion for Windows and for developers, 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 all the stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but besides Windows, besides Amazon, besides OpenStack, we all operate on abstractions and on different layer of abstractions. So what we want our developers to be able to is to choose the abstraction layer they need, is to choose the specific set of uh, requirements uh, they need for their particular goal. And here comes our next part, the uh, design by contract paradigm, the another corner, cornerstone of Murano, and the another basic paradigm we have invented when, well, not invented, used when we're designing Murano's core, Murano's engine. So design by contract uh, allows you as an application developer to specify the required inputs or required resources or required objects uh, which are needed for your applications to run and specify on the very specific level of details you need. And the rest of the details will be substituted by the environment, by the policy, by the exact cloud, cloud you have chosen to deploy your application for. So this is a very simple example. As a user, I will just say that I need a powerful database. That's what, as a user, I just request. So more engineering-like approach will be to just reformulate it that I need a SQL-compatible database that runs on a node which has at least X IOPS, like X may be a user input. And uh, this is an engineering requirement which needs to be expressed in Murano so that the Murano application is able to choose between different building blocks, those Lego bricks, uh, suitable for that particular application. So in our slide here, we have the application on the left and the database, which is an input property for that, required attribute for the application to run. And the contract on that input property says that it should be a powerful database. And now let's reformulate that in Murano language. So at the first part, the contract just stayed any object. The dollar sign just corresponds to just plain old object. So on, on, the, on the right, we have the applications which sue the current contract. Of course, any object matches anything on the right. Now let's just write our contract and say that we need a SQL compatible database. We have modified our contract and we have added this uh, keyword check for the class, which means that the object which is being passed to this property should inherit the base class from DB package called SQL compatible. That's just a basic interface which comes out with standard, uh, standard Murano application library and uh, any application developer in the world who targets the application for Murano may inherit their classes in their packages from this base interface. So any interface, uh, any application which inherits this interface will be filtered by this contract. And uh, so you may see that uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Trove, MariaDB, and Oracle PDB matches this contract, but MongoDB is unlikely, unlikely. Well, Mongo is not very good at SQL. So uh, let's modify the contract slightly. Let's say that we're not just speaking about SQL compatible, but we want just a MySQL compatible. So I have changed the contract. I have changed the base class for the interface. And uh, uh, the filtering got slightly stricter, so the Postgres and Oracle are out of luck here. And now we have just a choice of two, uh, two applications, two run applications. One just provides MySQL, which is, is being deployed on a virtual machine by Murano, or it may be a container or, well, anything which is, deploys the MySQL server on demand. And the second implementation is Trove MariaDB, that's the implementation which uses OpenStack Trove to provide databases on demand. So database as a service using Trove. 
There are two applications in Murano which inherit the same base interface, DB MySQL, but have different implementations of the same thing. However, let me add the third part of the contract. Let me check that the node which runs database has a flavor and the IOPS attribute of that flavor is greater than X. So for the virtual machine based deployments, we can get the flavor, we can get the node first of all, we can get the flavor and we can get the IOPS attribute of that flavor. And so we may check that the uh, particular attributes of the particular object in Murano deployment matches that contract. So for Trove, we do not have nodes since Trove is an OpenStack service. It's not, it, it doesn't run on virtual machines. And of course, we don't have flavors for them. And it's important to notice that this is not just a, a picking of existing objects, but this is also a contract which applies on the creation of new objects. So when your Murano environment does not have the database already deployed, Murano will just offer you to create a new database. And thus, when you are customizing its properties, it will not allow you to pick the class which does not match the contract, or to, to pick the value of instance flavor which does not match the contract. So at this point, you will be just guided by Murano to the proper deployment configuration. And so when you build that configuration, you will have the deployment capable to bind all the building blocks provided by different application developers to suit your needs. So that's designed by contract. And uh, now let's move to the last part of what is Murano. So that's a declarative versus imperative. Uh, well, that's also the basic programming paradigm, nothing new invented here. And the idea is that Murano actually combines both these approaches and that's what brings more power to it. So when you're speaking about declarative, you're just defining the final state of your infrastructure or applications uh, which you want to achieve. So you just specify that you want your application to run on five nodes and they should be connected to a specific network and have floating IP addresses assigned and the final configuration of your say load balancer application should it include round robin balancing on HTTP 80. That's the declarative definition of what you want. And this is actually the input properties validated by the contracts we have just discussed. But then how you actually do, how you achieve that final state that's usually a different problem and it has different types of solutions. So for example, in case of heat, we have the declarative part uh, expressed as a heat stack, as heat stack template. And, uh, and the imperative part is usually uh, implemented as heat plugins, which know how to properly communicate with uh, underlying OpenStack uh, APIs and services to provision VMs, to create networks, to bind VMs to these networks, and to execute the software configuration on those VMs. Uh, and that's cool, that's powerful, but as application developer, I very often do not have the access to the heat plugins, since heat plugins require the administrative privileges to, de to be deployed on the particular cloud. And we wanted Murano to be a catalog of applications. So these Lego bricks could be contributed by different people from around the world who do not have administrative privileges on the clouds on which these applications will be run. And so we have added the imperative capabilities to Murano. So the actual workflows, the actual scenarios, the actual sequences of API calls could be expressed not in Python or some other high level uh, programming language which requires, you know, hardcore programming skills, but to be part of Murano class definitions. Murano classes are defined in a very simple plain YAML notation, which just available to pretty much everyone who has access to the cloud and can upload the Murano packages to it. And so you are able as an application developer to specify the workflows which will uh, provide the interaction with external APIs or something internal, some data transformation or some uh, user notification schemas or well, pretty much everything which is, uh, which is required for your application to properly run. At the same time, it's safe 
uh, from Murano PL code, that's how we call our programming language, Murano PL. Uh, from Murano PL code, you cannot execute nothing which will compromise your cloud. You cannot do arbitrary input-output. You can just call the specific set of uh, cloud APIs. You cannot do input-output operations on files with, uh, on, your, on your controller nodes, on uh, your OpenStack hardware, because it's, it may be unsafe to do that since the code is provided by the end user. And so it's a balance of power in terms of, of programming power and the safety and security in terms of sandboxed environments. And so how all of this applies to multi-cloud approach? Uh, so as I said, the base class hierarchy allows us to build the, res to, to build the um, abstractions of the cloud resources uh, and have the implementations for different kind of uh, cloud providers. So for the node, for the compute node instance, uh, we have an abstraction for OpenStack VM, we have an abstraction for VMware VM, we have an abstraction for Amazon VM, and we have an abstraction for Kubernetes pod and Docker container. All of them may be considered just a regular compute node. And here is a just sample topology, sample architecture of what we have done in Murano. So it just stops being just theory, it becomes practice, and it even works which is strange to me. Uh, so uh, we are combining OpenStack Cloud with uh, AWS EC2 Cloud uh, orchestrated by Murano. So in our private OpenStack Cloud, we run Murano in a regular deployment way. So you just may take regular dev stack. Don't forget that Murano is just a plain upstream project available to any OpenStack deployment. You just take the dev stack, deploy Murano, uh, just run the VMs with it, but at the same time, you are able to communicate from Murano engine with uh, Amazon EC2 APIs via a regular HTTP, HTTP protocol. Uh, this will allow Murano to spin up VMs in AWS. Uh, at the same time, uh, Murano needs to configure VMs, and very often it's quite impossible to just SSH to your public cloud nodes because you don't want your public cloud nodes to be accessible with SSH. So we have suggested the topology which has a dedicated virtual machine in AWS space, which runs a messaging broker. We use RabbitMQ, but there may be plenty of choices. Uh, and that VM is also deployed by Murano, but uh, it has a capability to configure the other VMs by providing a message bus. So Murano just puts the messages in MQP protocol just into this messaging broker, and all the VMs which are spawned by AWS communicate with that message broker and receive the commands. So this allows you to establish the connection between Murano and the uh, AWS spawned VMs without uh, opening them to the world. Uh, so you just have to secure the single uh, message broker machine, or you may have a cluster of them if you need higher performance, but that's definitely just reduces the surface of attack in case you, you, you assume that your public cloud may be compromised. At the same time, uh, very often when you need the hybrid cloud approach, uh, you need to be able to communicate back from the public VMs to the private ones or to containers running in your private cloud. Uh, for example, when you have a hybrid application uh, running the two-tier or three-tier or Applicate this free tier topology when the front end, for example, runs in public cloud and the back end runs in the private one. You need to have a connection between uh, public and private to get the data. And for that, you may utilize any technology which is accessible in that particular cloud. So, for example, AWS has a VPC which allows you to establish the connection between uh, uh, Amazon's network and your enterprise network. Uh, and if that cloud doesn't support, you have another implementation of that base class which just allows to establish the connection using some other generic VPN technology. For example, in our example, we have deployed the open VPN on all the nodes and those uh, established the VPN to our private network. So this gives us the basic understanding of what we can do. Besides VMs, we can, uh, we can also have the networks, we have security groups, we have ports, we have volumes. Uh, all of these are abstracted as a base class in Murano library and have the concrete implementations for both AWS and OpenStack. And we'll add more. Uh, 
then this is just a way how to deploy the applications in Murano. This is a very simple and quite a naive way to do that. Um, Murano environments consist of multiple applications which just provide the deploy logic and own the resources, like node, the nodes, own the nodes or own the VMs, and those owning their states. So when the application deploys a node, it calls the underlying, uh, underlying class which knows how to communicate with a particular cloud. For OpenStack, we use Heat. For AWS, we just use uh, AWS API. Uh, and then just applications uh, run their deploy procedures concurrently, and this just gives us the deployment of complex multi-part application. However, this thing has, uh, has issues. Uh, it's too open, that's the most important, and too flexible. Sometimes it's bad. Uh, for the application developers, uh, the flexibility means that they're on their own when they just have to implement the whole deployment logic. Morana just says, okay, you have an application, you have a method called deploy, put all your logic there. And the application developer has to put the Murano PL imperative logic to just spawn the resources, put the scripts on them, run them, and so on. That's too, too open, too uh, unopinionated. So the developers often say, okay, we just don't want that. We'll just use our old plain puppets, for example. And often they have the common mistakes when they're following this approach. Uh, for example, uh, they are storing the state of the things on the VMs. And VMs in the clouds are cattle. They can be killed any, any, at any time and be respawned at any given moment. So the state should be persisted in their orchestrator, which is Moran in this case. So what we are suggesting is to just bring more application lifecycle management to Murano and to Murano applications. We are suggesting an even driven workflow model. So the Murano applications written by, uh, by the developers just provide the hooks or event handlers for different kind of uh, events happening during the application lifecycle. For example, when the application, let me just switch to the next slide. Uh, so this is an example of event driven workflow. So the application just, it's to the right, it just provides the handlers of different lifecycle events like the pre-configure when you de decide on which nodes to install your application, the installing a node when you just upload a particular software configuration script on the node and run it, and different handlers like what to do on start, what to do on stop, what to do on health check, and so on. And the other set of classes, which we call node set, group the different kind of resources and orchestrate them uh, independently of applications and just notifying the application that it needs to do some event handler. Like when I have spawned a new VM or a new container, I just need the application to configure it properly. So I just pass this node to the application and the application has access to its base interfaces to call the appropriate methods. And as a result, we uh, are having some opinionated workflow, some reference, uh, some reference models of uh, sequences of events which will happen on the nodes and will happen on applications. And here is just a brief list of what we just added for the first prototype uh, for the application developer. Of course, the application developer doesn't have to just specify all of them. If you don't want your application to be healable, you don't need to implement the health checks or heal up. Or like if you are pretty sure that your software will never be upgraded, probably you don't need a check for upgrades, but you better have. Uh, but so this is just a base set of application lifecycle events. And that's already the QA staff. I think I had one more slide. So the idea is that we will have the base reference architectures. I think it's like here, yeah. So we'll have the basic reference implementations for standard enterprise grade patterns like the stateful, uh, stateful applications like databases, the stateless applications like web farms, and combinations of these into two, three, and entire sets. We'll have these reference implementations be cloud agnostic, so uh, they will operate on the base node class, base network class, base port class, security group, and so on. So you will not depend on the particular cloud implementation when you are defining your application. But if other application developers need more specific functionality, specific functionality of some cloud, they may always narrow down the contract by applying the extra checks and extra type 
uh, type casts at the particular implementations they are writing. So that's how we are going to um, that's how we are going to work with uh, with Murano. Uh, I think yeah, this is a call to action slide. Uh, so uh, this was just a description of the prototype we have done with Murano. And we are going to turn this prototype into a full-fledged application framework, which will be released with the Newton release of OpenStack, or maybe even somewhere before that. So we want you, the developers, or the consumers of the cloud applications, to join this effort to frame the set of requirements you need for the multi-cloud use cases you may have, and join the collaborative effort of Murano OpenStack community, and just make sure that you are heard, your voice is heard, and your use cases are reflected in the framework which we are going to build. So join the Murano development team and try joining us on Thursday when we are going to have the design, design summit sessions to decide what we are going to do in Newton with Murano. As one guy once said, developers, 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 developers. <laughs> we need you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? It was that clear. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, come on up to the mic. Thanks. So, um, the lifecycle management, does it include, like, the evacuate is the one that deletes the VM that gets created in the AWS or something? How does, you know, Murano controls, like, you know, once a VM is created in the AWS? Because I saw Murano is now controlling, actually, actually uh, acting as a control plane for the VMs that is getting spinned up in the AWS, not the OpenStack control plane, if I understand correctly. Yes. So, there are two questions. One, how do, how do we delete the VM that is getting created in the AWS number one? And if Murano is not, uh, you know, if the OpenStack control plane is not controlling the VMs that are spawned in the other cloud environments, would it put it, uh, you know, a risk in uh, Murano because Murano is an uh, additional plugin for now, actually? Uh, well, this, thanks for the question. Uh, so there are several parts here. Uh, so, uh, how we manage uh, the resources. So, the idea is that Murano owns the state of the application it runs. And the state includes the reference to the particular resource which, uh, which just runs the VM or network or whatever. So, Murano always uh, aware where, where some resources run. And so, when the resources deallocated, Murano knows how to, not Murano, the application developer who defined that resource may provide the code to free up the resources in the particular, in the particular, uh, particular cloud. So uh, to just remove the VM from any cloud where you have created it, you just need to remove the resource from Murano uh, object graph, which just represents the current state of the environment and Murano will take care of uh, calling the appropriate event handlers to uh, just free up the resource. Of course, this requires the Murano control plane to be available at that time. So if the Murano itself dies as a service, then of course this will not happen. However, Murano as a service is high available. So it just has a multiple workers, it has its own load balancers, and it's actually quite independent from the rest of OpenStack infrastructure in terms of when it, when it comes to orchestrating other clouds. You don't need Keystone, you don't need Nova, you don't need Heat, you just need Murano services to run. And because of that, uh, Murano being able to, to keep track on the state always is able to just free up the resources whenever they are. In, OpenStack or in, uh, in AWS or whatever. So I think that this should answer a question, but please let me know if it doesn't. Other questions? Anybody else? Oh, come on up. So as, a, as an application developer, uh, could you explain uh, what all things that I'll have to write to, uh, so let's say if I am developing a uh, multi-tier Java web app, and I want to deploy it to, uh, let's say, AWS 
or some w just one particular infrastructure. So if I understand correctly, I need to be able to write not only the actual Java stuff, but also the Murano uh, language, understand that and write event handlers, what happens when a node gets deallocated de and things like that. So what's the power of the Murano language and uh, do you think that now that is complicating the life of application developers to have to actually write two different things? Okay, the, uh, yes, question. The, the question is good. And the thing is that uh, you may define the application lifecycle handlers if you need to, but you don't have to because the base classes on the hierarchy are already there. So if you're just running just yet another Java application, and you don't want to redefine the topology, most probably you'll have a base class for Java application, uh, which is already present in the library and written either by Murano team or by someone else. So what you just have to do is to instantiate that object with providing, say, your Git repository, where it takes the like, sources of your Java application and everything else, including like provisioning VMs, uh, checking out the source code, it uh, running like Maven to build up your jars and then deploying the jars on your Tomcat container uh, will be just done for you. But the power is that you are able to customize the deployment by combining different Lego bricks. So the default applications may use Tomcat to host your Java application. Uh, what happens if you want to, to use WebSphere or JBoss? Probably there is a, another uh, Murano application, Murano package, which knows how to deploy JBoss. But what happens if it exists but does a thing not in the right way, in a, thing, in, in a way that you would like to redefine some part of that workflow, like do some post configuration of your JBoss after it's installed. So you just take the existing applications, uh, subclass it, just create a derived class, override the particular like on post configure method, and just run some script on the VM, which will be running your JBoss container. And after that, this newly modified JBoss application will be able uh, to work with all other Java applications which just require a server container, because it implements the standard JBoss interface, which, is, which on its own implements the base server container interface. So that's just a regular object-oriented approach which allows you to combine things into a single uh, meta application and you're able to substitute smaller bricks with the ones on your own. And speaking about the language complexity, well, yes, it's always hard when you have to learn the new language. However, Murano PL was uh, designed so it's easy to learn and it has its uh, its form, its container format as YAML. So it's just a regular YAML, uh, YAML like thing. So I think, yeah, so this is just an example of uh, the declaration of ah, the slide, the slide's already gone. So yeah, I, if you want, I, you may just come, come by to my laptop and uh, I'll just show you how the YAMLs look like. It's, yeah, here it is. So that's just a definition of the application we have. It's Apache HTTP server. It extends the standard application class and it adds the two properties on it. So you have the contracts, you have default values. Uh, so it's reasonably simple and it does not add complexity when you don't need it. But when you need it, it's on the, on the way to help you to just define the needed parts uh, or redefine the needed parts of the workflow. Other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, how different is Murano than other past solutions like Cloud Foundry and you know OpenShift? Looks like there's a lot of duplication here, so I'm trying to understand that. Uh, great question. Uh, so first of all, uh, we don't want to duplicate anything which we can uh, reuse. The idea is that Murano is an integration framework. It's not an opinionated orchestration tool or, or, I don't know, wondering to rule them all. It's a thing which just can help you abstract the different things into some base stand baseline standard and delegate the actual implementation to the particular, uh, particular implementation. So it may deploy the applications with Cloud Foundry. 
And at the same time, it may provide the interfaces for Cloud Foundry to deploy its application via Murano. And we actually have this implementation already present in Murano upstream. We have the uh, service broker API of Cloud Foundry, and so Murano may act as Cloud Foundry service broker. And at the same time, uh, Murano is uh, not a commercial or proprietary product. It's part of the OpenStack Big Tent, and the idea is that uh, for people targeting their applications for OpenStack, and so first of all for OpenStack, and then for other clouds, they want to have like the minimum common denominator, uh, which will provide the universal capabilities for all OpenStack clouds, and that's going to be Morana. And then if they want to have the specific implementation uh, which will utilize the maximum powerful of the particular tool, be it a Cloud Foundry, be it uh, any other software configuration or, uh, or, or, or infrastructure orchestration tool, uh, they may have the Murano package which does it for them by implementing the same base interface. Cool. Well, okay. thank you guys thank you. very much. Appreciate it. If you have any questions, we'll be up here. Thanks.